Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be showing you how I made a DIY large watercolor palette to hold all of my Daniel Smith paints. This became a necessity after I did my Daniel Smith swatch with me video. My palette was already pretty stocked full of colors and then a wonderful viewer named Catherine sent me some more colors that I didn't already have in my collection, namely some Primatech colors, and I needed a place to go ahead and store them all since a traditional palette would no longer do. The inspiration of this palette came directly from Arlisha from Arla Bean and if you haven't already checked out her channel you should absolutely do so. She is a YouTube content creator as well as a Skillshare teacher and she made a huge watercolor palette for her Sennelier watercolor set. So I took some of the things that she did in that video and I added a few of my own and I'm going to go ahead and talk you through the process today. I went ahead and found this box at Michael's. Uh, it's an art and craft store if you're not familiar with it already, if you're not in the country, and they sell a lot of unfinished wood products. I was looking something that had a really narrow profile so that I wouldn't have to lift my arm up considerably high to reach into the palettes, and this was the closest I could find. I was trying to decide if I should go straight across the top, if I should go along the side, what would be easier to paint with in actuality, um, which direction the pans fit if they needed to be horizontal, or vertical and I'm just kind of testing out the waters here. So now we're going to get to the actual part of the video where we're constructing the palette to be functional for our purposes. Starting with, I am sealing the wood with Dorland's wax. This is a wax I got based on one of Angela Fair's tutorials on how to uh, seal watercolor paintings on wood surfaces, which I absolutely love to do. And I thought I would go ahead and rub down the wood so that uh, water that would fall on it wouldn't seep into it and damage the wood over time. Now I do wish that I had stained this first and I wanted to, but I didn't have any stain on hand and then I got impatient. So if you can be more patient than I was to make this look extra pretty, I would recommend staining it first just to make it pop that little bit more. But basically I rubbed down all of the outside edges as well as the bottom portion of the tray on the inside where I would be putting the pans of watercolor. You don't need to go ahead and seal the top part if you're going to be doing it like I did, and that is that I was preparing the surface to be a mixing area. Now I have some footage of me using some indoor house paint that I got excited because it said the word enamel on it, and I know that you're supposed to use enamel paint to go ahead and coat some of these surfaces when you're using watercolors. What I did not realize is that it was indoor paint and really not suitable for use with watercolor. My second mistake was that I was using a paintbrush to apply this paint and I ended up with some really large streak marks. So lesson to be had, do not use indoor house paint for this and do not use a brush if you can help it. What I ended up using after I filmed this segment of the video was the Rust-Oleum Gloss Protective Enamel. Unfortunately, I don't have any footage of me using this product because I had to do it outside in a well-ventilated area and the lighting out there was absolutely atrocious. In short, go ahead and tape off the edges that you don't want painted. Go ahead and put out a nice protective surface like newspaper or a painting tarp and spray the lid as according to the instructions on my can of paint. It said to do two coats fairly uh, close together in time, just a few minutes apart, and that they should be light and uh, little spritzes. So I did two layers on top of the paint that I already have. You might want to do three if you don't have a primer on your wood first. After that, go ahead and let it dry for at least 24 hours, and this is what it will look like. It is really, really glossy, and again, if I hadn't used that paintbrush, it would have been a nice, smooth surface. As it stands right now on my version, I have those little grooves that are a little bit annoying to mix paint over, but it's not the worst thing in the world. Then it came time to adhere my pans to the surface. If you watched our leashes video, she used adhesive little pads to stick down her pads, and I will say up front, that is absolutely the more secure way to do that. Um, so if you want something that's just really, really solid that is going to stay down there for a long period of time, go ahead and use adhesive. I use Zots in a lot of my other palettes, and I believe that all those are listed in my Amazon influencer shop. What I wanted to do for this one is make magnetic strips so that I could switch around the paints if I get more in my collection because you know me and I don't like to have my paints out of order, so I'd want to be able to move them around. The problem with that though is that all of these little tiny magnet products don't have great reviews in terms of their stay power. And I learned firsthand that uh, 
they're not super, super strong. What I did is I got these little strips of magnetic tape and then to put on the bottom side of the pans, I got this product called Bull Pull Magnets. So the problem with these two magnetic products together is that the magnets don't necessarily stick evenly to every part of the tape on the bottom of the box and so the pans don't always want to sit nice and snugly where they're supposed to luckily the adhesive i guess luckily the adhesive isn't that strong on these half pans and you can actually pull the magnet off reposition it and then put it back down on the strip to make sure that they are lining up flat so as you're going to see here in just a second these are not going to be secure enough to travel with this is a studio palette i don't know why you need to travel with so many colors anyway but the magnets are not very strong especially on the end of the connection strips there they do stay well enough that if you don't bang it against something the magnets will Will hold in place. Another problem that I had with these magnets is that the edges of the tape wanted to curl up. This comes in a roll, so the magnet naturally wants to kind of have a curvature to it. So I did have to use super glue to go ahead and adhere the rows of <laughs> magnets down to the wood surface. So I did that for every row. You can see here, just putting down some super glue, making sure it sticks a little bit, making sure to the other side, holding it down until it dried, and then moving forward. So this was a very laborious process and it really just depends on your own preference on if you wanna be able to move these around or if you just wanna use the adhesive dots. I think in hindsight, maybe next time I do something like this, I would maybe choose adhesive dots, question um, mark. I do love how easy it is to rearrange the pans and you can see me doing that here where I had to move a couple things around and I was able to lift them up, scooch them down and had no problems with that at all. I will say here that I do wanna go ahead and at some point attach some kind of like retaining wall to the last row of pans. I think that would be really, really helpful in getting them to stay nice and put. So I'll probably pick up like a little wooden dowel or something of the like to go ahead and glue into the palette uh, to keep this last row of colors intact. Finally, I had this teeny, teeny, tiny little gap on one side of the pans and it just so happened that the magnetic tape that I had was the right thickness to fill that gap. So I wasn't using the magnetic properties of this, but I did go ahead and use an extra strip of this to line up on the right side of the box here. And that let the final row of pans or column of pans fit nice and snugly down into this set. Now it is time for the moment of truth. And I really should have tested this out before I did all of the work to put the pans in the box, but spoiler alert, it did work out fine. Here, you're gonna go ahead and see me testing the mixing surface here, first with ultramarine blue and then with phthalo blue. You can see that it started to beat up, which is pretty typical of enamel surfaces on your metal tins or on plastic palettes. So it didn't really bother me all that much. I can say that I did a full painting after I recorded recorded this video and it did just fine in that and it ended up sticking to a larger portion of the palette and you'll see that in the next video so be sure to come back for that. The second moment of truth was to make sure that the paints did not stain the enamel so when I go ahead and wipe this off you're going to see that the ultramarine wiped clear away and there was absolutely no staining whatsoever. The phthalo blue is a staining color and it is expected that it would stain but you can see here the staining is pretty minimal so I'm really excited for the prospect of this and of course I have more of this spray paint so if it ever gets stained too bad I can just protect all the other surfaces and go ahead and put some more paint down. Here I'm just showing you some brushes that fit in this box so if you wanted to keep them in here for storage purposes on your desktop or if you end up making this with, ad with adhesive instead of magnets and wanted to travel with it as a plain air set mini brushes will fit. A lot of the really large rounds don't but all of my other types of brushes uh, a size like six and smaller fit with no problem. You may have noticed when I was putting some of the pans into the box that I was stopping to write some pigment numbers on the side. Um, but the most important part is, for me at least, is to make sure I know where each and every color is, especially because this is such a large set and I don't know every color in here because a lot of them were gifted to me as samples. I wanted to go ahead and make a color chart. So I'm showing you here how I do that. So the first step for this is to take a piece of paper that is the same size as your pans. And then I go ahead and line up that paper and then put little tick marks where each of the pans intersect all four sides of the paper. Then I use a ruler to connect those lines. And then I have a true to life grid of all the colors that are in this palette. 
I had mixed thoughts on whether or not I wanted to go ahead and show you the swatching of this card because I just did the Daniel Smith swatch with me video. So you've probably already seen most of these colors, at least aside from the new ones that I acquired. And I didn't want you to be bored to tears or anything like that. But I do want to mention a couple things that I did differently. After I went through this entire sheet and you can see here, I'm skipping every other box so that they don't bleed together. Um, and then I'll do the opposite for the next row and so on and so forth. But after all of them are completely dry, I also did a second layer, which is what I do on my swatch cards for my swatch binder. I wanted to have that on this chart. I haven't done that before, but I feel like it's really useful information to have. So there is more information at the end of this video, including the giveaway winner for the giveaway that I announced last week. But for the rest of the swatching, for those of you who really, really enjoy it, I'm going to go ahead and speed up the footage, put on some music, and I will be back in just a few moments. If you don't want to go ahead and watch this, you can just go ahead and skip forward and uh, I'll I'll see you on the other side.
All right, welcome back to the tutorial section of this video. The last thing I'm doing to prepare this palette is that I am setting up a little pocket for my swatch card on the front of the binder. I'm doing this by taking a Ziploc bag or a binder sheet clear protector thingy um, and cutting that down to size with a self-healing mat, a ruler, and an ex a box cutter or an X-Acto knife. And that way I have a nice little pocket that my card can sit in. Now the reason that I am making this little sheet instead of just laminating it with packing tape like I typically do for my smaller sets is that there are still spaces on this card that can be filled in and I want to be able to make sure that the uh, sheet of paper can grow with me. So you can see here I adhered it with some washi tape which I wouldn't recommend for sticking to the wood itself because it doesn't stick all that well. If you do have a suggestion for me on what tape to use to adhere this to the box, I don't know if I should just use packing tape or if I should try a different type of decorative tape, let me know what you think in the comments below. So we're going to go ahead and do a little bit of an overview of what the video was as well as showing you here the finished product. And that is that we have our large palette box here with the complete swatch card on the front side with its little protector and everything. When we open it up, we have all of our paint hands on the magnetic strips, but you can also use adhesive dots if you want it to be more secure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I do want to get a little retaining wall to go ahead and put in there to keep them a little bit more secure. And you could also use this area for either more pans or storage of your brushes or other supplies. On the inside lid here, we have a gloss enamel paint. You can find all of the products that I used for this video in the description below. And uh, I want to thank you guys so much for watching this video. So I hope that you find this video useful. Again, make sure to check out our Leashes channel if you haven't already, who gave me the inspiration to go ahead and make this palette myself. But before you go, I do owe you a winner of the 15K giveaway that I hosted last week for the Colors of Nature watercolors. And and the winner is Lego Ducky, who I have already contacted and worked out arrangements to deliver the new set of Colors of Nature watercolors. But I do want to thank each and every one of you for your comments. I know I wasn't able to reply to each and every one because there were just an absurd amount of them. There were over 500 unique commenters on that video, but I did read every single comment and they just warmed my heart to hear about your favorite videos on the channel. So thank you so much to each and every one of you who makes this community just incredibly amazing. I have so, so, so enjoyed having you here along my watercolor journey and look forward to sharing many, many more memories with you. Thank you, of course, to my patrons over on Patreon who are making it possible for me to keep this content going. If you haven't already heard, we have met our stretch goal of restarting the Color Spotlight series and every single one of my patrons, regardless of the pledge level, get to vote on the colors that are going to be featured. So if you would like to have a voice in that, go ahead and head on over to Patreon and see if there's something there that strikes your fancy. Until next time, I will see you in the next video and happy painting.